Okay, I think we, we have to start. Okay, uh, good day everyone uh, and a very good afternoon. Okay, great to see you all here, uh, to all the, AD, the ADP lecturers, students, alumni, and students from other semesters and friends as well who join us for today, uh, good afternoon. Okay, today we are glad to have our second distinguished speaker for our SABD ADP Design Lecture Series 2. Okay, architect William T. Uh, Jr. from WT Architecture and Design Studio. Okay, he will be uh, presenting. Uh, he's now currently in Manila, the Philippines. Okay, also, uh, we would like to welcome here as our new adjunct associate professor for Taylor's University School of Architecture. Okay, he will be having two talks uh, in. I think scheduled this month, okay, one in ADP, which is today, and UDS, Urban Design Studio, which will be at the end of the month, September 30th. Okay, hello. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, the, the purpose of the ADP lecture series is a platform to ex uh, expose students to real world learning by engaging them to distinguish guest speakers' expertise to their design work, practices, philosophy, research interests, and advocacies. Okay, uh, the lecture topics are aligned with the themes and focus of the studio. Likewise, aid and inspire students in the development of their final design project. Um, okay, about our speaker for today, the uh, um, second distinguished uh, speaker, um, William is a graduate of National University of Singapore with a master's degree in urban design uh, in 2012 and acquired this bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Santo Tomas in Manila uh, in 2002. Uh, together with friends, he formed a partner partnership in 2005 and finally founded WTA Architecture and Design Studio in 2007. In the 18 years of his professional career, he has worked on hundreds of projects ranging from retail shops, housing projects to large scale malls, the residential condominium, hotels and master plan developments. As a firm believer in sustainable planning and the advantages of urban living, he tries to imagine a better curated, uh, a better curated design focus a uh, society where beautiful things and pleasant environments are uh, present, even in the densest city centers. Okay. Uh, we will be talking today on social architecture, uh, social architecture that creates with communities in mind. It operates more in the manner of discovery and exploration rather than breakthrough and invention. It promotes qualities that create a gentler and more harmonious a uh, pace of societal development than the peaks of uh, true uh, triumphalist achieve achievement. William and WTA believes in promoting it as a studio with the idea of humanity's story uh, more and more be socially inclusive than selectively exclusive. Okay. Quoting him, I wish I would leave my city behind better than what I had found it. I want to affect a greater change in our society. I think being an architect empowers us to allows us allows us to do things that can impact so much on our society. That's from architect Lundy. So I think without further ado or further delay, uh, please welcome architect William Lundy. Thanks, Prince. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, you know, thanks to Prince and Manny for, you know, inviting me over and, you know, um, I look forward to, you know, sharing some ideas with everyone and hearing your thoughts, you know, about the things that we've been doing, you know, during this period of our, you know, um, during this pandemic period. So today, you know, uh, primarily I'd like to give you guys, share with you guys what we did for, you know, our city during this pandemic with the emergency quarantine facilities. Um, but, you know, that story, of course, always kind of like begins with our studio. Um, if you see here, our studio is quite young. Um, we're, I think, mostly below, well, most of the guys are below 30 or something like that. Um, but I think 
what that really means is that we're primarily looking to explore new ideas. You know, that's really our main focus in the office. Um, how to kind of like figure out a way forward for how we, we are building our city, especially for a developing country like the Philippines and for a city like Manila where so much more needs to be built. Um, we're looking for a better way, you know, better solutions. And, you know, that's been the focus of our office recently. Um, just to give you a context, this is the city of Metro Manila. If you see the, you know, the dark red center, that's the actual city of Manila. And then the red boundary is the metropolitan city or Metro Manila. Um, the city of Manila itself is around 1.8 million. Um, Metro Manila is around 14 million people. Um, but if you kind of like look at, you know, the urban region of Manila, it really stretches out to kind of like the adjoining provinces or regions. And that's why during this pandemic, um, the quarantine actually in Manila is called NCR plus, which is the national capital region and then the adjoining provinces. So this urban region or mega city or mega Manila, as we call it, um, is actually home to about 28 to 32 million people, you know, depending on where you end. Um, this stretches out to about 86 kilometers to the north and 100 kilometers to the south. And this, as it stands, is probably currently, I think, the, the third or fourth biggest uh, mega city in the world. And Manila itself, and mega Man Metro Manila itself, is kind of like the second or third densest city. Um, the city of Manila proper is the densest city in the world. And our district of Tondo is the densest political unit in the world. And so you know all these thought, you know all these terms about density and how it affects how we live here in Manila. You know it's really a very strong determining factor into how we move forward you know, with developing our city. And we feel like you know it's a natural progression of humanity to build ever bigger urban agglomerations. And you know that's always been the singular direction of how civilization has evolved, right? And there's really is no blueprint for how we can build a city of this size and magnitude, right? There is no Western you know, ideology or thought that would allow us to build at this scale. In fact, most of them would be you know, um, screaming if you know, forced to live in such a setting, right? So we feel like as, you know, as people here, you know, as Asians, we have to kind of like develop this idea. Um, this is an image I always show. This is where I grew up in. This is in Tondo. And you know that red line there is actually my daily commute or daily route from my home to my school. And so every day I can like walk this route and you know, this is my house, our office, and then our school actually. Um, so you know, going through a city like Manila, what you see every day is like you see so many people, you know, and what actually happens is that your urban landscape is really about you know, the people in the city, you know, you don't notice as much the buildings around you as you do who is living inside your city, right? It's about your neighbors, you know, the people you pass through. So that's really what shapes us, you know, as a people, you know, um, I think Filipinos especially were so proud about, you know, our, you know, the warmth of Filipi Filipino warmth and hospitality and all those things. And, you know, this idea of bayanihan, you know, about helping each other or neighborly, Ness, you know so when you look at the philippines right anywhere you go you basically see you know street ball that's kind of like one of the things that we are so proud of or happy about all of us play basketball um it's something we really love and any barangay you go you'll see kids playing on the streets um there's always this kind of like um sari sari store what what we call kind of like uh corner stores um, so these are kind of like mom and pop shops. And I always kind of like show this photo because right across this store or these stores actually is actually a supermarket that sells the same goods. But you know, there's always uh, an idea of convenience and you know, neighborliness to be able to buy you know, from these small stores. And that's why they still thrive even to this day when we have so many convenience stores, you know, so many groceries and supermarkets popping up around the city. Another thing that's very unique to the Philippines is, you know, our main mode of transportation are, co are called the jeepneys, you know, and this is a vehicle where you sit shoulder to shoulder, you know, against each other. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to survive the pandemic given the situation, but, you know, that's really what we grew up with, you know, um, being able to kind of like, you know, take your daily commute, sitting right next to each other, actually squeeze together. And, 
you know, it's really interesting, you know, like, you know, this is really what surrounds us, you know, this, this kind of like mass or immensity of people, you know, that's everywhere. In the city of Metro Manila, you will always find two structures. Uh, one is the chapel, right? So meaning anywhere you go, whether you're in a shopping mall, you know, in a random street corner, in a hospital, you know, um, basically, you know, every major space, there's going to be a chapel. Uh, we're a very religious people. Um, but what this also means is that kind of like the Catholic Church has learned how to reach out to everyone, right? Um, that's why I guess, you know, every Filipino, when we have a problem, we pray, right? We want to pass our exams. We want to, you know, win the lottery. You know, um, we want a girlfriend, we pray. You know, that's what we do. Um, we're a very faithful people. Another thing that you will see is that the whole country is divided into um, these political entities called barangays. You know? And so there are thousands of them. Um, in Manila, particularly, every street, every block almost is one barangay. And so the barangay kind of like ends up being the front line you know, towards which or how we engage with our government. Um, let's say you have domestic quarrels, you have, you know, you're fighting with your wife, or your, your neighbor's too noisy singing karaoke um you know that's where you go to when you have you know uh, local civil complaints right and this has shown also in the way how you know this pandemic has been dealt with it particularly focuses on the barangay as the main distribution points for a lot of things for example we had barangay markets you know uh, that's how the you know the social amelioration program was given out as well um so a lot of things that happen, you know, in our country, when you want to reach out to the people actually are funneled through these barangays. And what that means actually is that with these two institutions, the two biggest institutions in our country have learned that for them to be able to reach out to everyone, for them to be, you know, there immediately, you know, to be accessible to everyone, they have to go to the people, right? We cannot wait for people to go to come to our institutions, but rather we should or we need to reach out to them. And I think this has affected, you know, how we think about architecture in a lot of ways. Um, so our main advocacy as an office is this idea about social architecture. And slowly it has started to permeate or affect, you know, um, our projects, how we are thinking process, our ideas. And, you know, it's basically about kind of like these three main things, right? Social architecture, um, an architect's role in society, and kind of like trying to develop an architecture that you know, is building, you know, our communities, right? So to talk about social architecture, it kind of like started with this project that we did called the Bookstop Project. And at that point in time, um, we were faced with this question that when you're designing libraries, right? One of the things that people always ask is, are libraries still relevant? Do people even go there? Do people even read books, right? Um, people are always, you know, on their phones, maybe trying to um, consume, um, short form literature rather than books but me personally i kind of like I, I really love the feel of books you know i love the feel of a page i love the you know the smell of a new book you know the kind of like the excitement when you're turning a page and trying to see what's next what's next and so i felt like maybe the books maybe books are not obsolete maybe we just have to find a better delivery method um this is a photo i took um at the new york public library this is the Rose Reading Room, I believe. Um, this is still one of the most, you know, beautiful reading rooms or library spaces in the world, right? And yet, you know, it lacks something because it's not a space that you feel like you're very, that's very casual, right? So one of the things that we wanted was to, what, how do we rethink our libraries? How do we make it accessible to everyone? And so at that point, we were always kind of like working around, you know, the old city of Intramuros. And this was the plaza, you know, the Philippines, each city is built around the plaza, um, kind of like coming from the Spanish law of the Indies, you know, how you start a city around this plaza with a church. And so we were looking at all these plazas and the spaces that were not being utilized as much. And we said, maybe we can activate them, right? So we started to think, what if we inserted a library in the park? You know, um, then you have all this space around you um, and you can just make it open to everyone. And kind of like one of the beauties there is that if you really look at the basic, you know, um, program of a library or at least the original form of a library, a library is just actually a room of shelves with books, 
you know, especially during ancient times or classical period when you can't, we, when we didn't have electricity, you took out the book, you read it outside and under the bright sun, which is a perfect setting actually to read a book, right? And we also kind of like latched onto this idea that libraries are not just places for books, it's actually a community center really. So, you know, it's a space where you actually uh, share ideas, um, where you actually help, you know, train people, invite, we invited artists, uh, we invited authors to give talks. Um, and, you know, it, it's really about trying to continue, you know, our storytelling narrative as a people, right? I mean, I think one of our richest traditions is, you know, the telling of stories, and we need to keep passing this down. And, you know, for us to be able to grow this kind of like very communal, very strong and very primal communal feeling, I think libraries are important. You know, they kind of like almost serve like, a bonfire, you know, in the night where people can gather, where, you know, you can share your thoughts. And the idea is to be able to design something that's so free, so open, that, you know, kids would feel comfortable, right? Going in, they can wander around, they can do whatever they want, right? Um, one of the kind of like byproducts of this project was this idea about how to solve, not idea, but like, you know, how it related to the street kids. You know, um, at first, you know, this was not one of the, you know, main considerations that we had. But when we started to bring in these books, we started to see all these um, street children actually hanging out in the library. And I remember distinctly one of the first times we actually brought in children's books. They were kind of like fighting about the books. And I told them, you know, there's like more than enough books for everyone. Um, and they started to ask if they can bring the books home. And so we had to explain to them, this is actually what a library is, you know, and they're like, really, it's free. And we're like, yes, that's what a library is. And, you know, it's sad in a way because we seem to not be able to find a third space like this, you know, for, you know, the more vulnerable parts of our community. And yet, you know, they actually want to be in a place like this. Um, they actually enjoy it, you know. I mean, most of these kids don't even know how to read, but they just, you know, enjoy this idea of browsing through the books. And then he started to have, you know, like young people, college students drop by, start teaching the kids, you know, start telling them stories. And for me, you know, every moment you actually can get a child off the streets and in a library, you know, it's a win for society. And so I think this was really what galvanized us to kind of like continue um, with this program until. Finally, I think a year ago or two, uh, we were able to convince um, the biggest shopping mall operator in our country, SM, to put the, you know, a library, an open library, you know, in their malls. And I believe as we move forward, you know, if we can have cinemas in our shopping malls, I think if the shopping mall really is the Asian version of a public place, then we need a library in them. And so we've been pushing for these low cost small libraries to be put everywhere. Um, because the idea is that you cannot, maybe we don't have the time to go to the library, but maybe we can allow them to come to us. So that kind of like started us into thinking about, you know, this idea about social architecture. And the first one was this idea about social intimacy, how we need to make spaces that are hyper local, you know, that are convenient, that are readily accessible. Um, what this means is basically we wanted to change architecture into kind of like how the mobile phones change computing now. So, you know, it's basically the difference between your relationship with your desktop or laptop computer and your mobile phone, right? You know, the mobile phone is accessible. It's always there. So maybe we need to make our institutions accessible and convenient. You know, it has to be everywhere. Instead of us going to the library or the museum, we bring the museum or library to us. And that's exactly what happened, you know, with all our barangays, you know, with the, like I said, 42,000 barangays in our country, 3,393 parishes, of course, and much, much more chapels. And we continued exploring this thought process when we started to, you know, develop this project, the Museo del Prado exhibi exhibition in the Philippines. Um, this was a project we did with the Spanish embassy and they wanted to do an exhibition. And so we started to convince them and say, Look, maybe what we can do is we can, you know, develop these low cost modules, but then try to, you know, mimic the, the museum experience, right? Try to bring them everywhere. And 
in many ways, it's actually a much better experience because what happens now is on your way to work, you can pass by the museum, this one. Um, on your way home, you can pass by this. So maybe every day, you know, you, you, you absorb a bit of a culture in your life, right? Or create, it enriches your creativity every day. And rather than this like experience of going to a museum and doing this amazing race checklist where you're trying to, you know, see the Mona Lisa for five seconds, maybe, and then the next one and so on and so forth. Now you have actually time to contemplate and really try to enjoy you know, art in the best setting, actually, which is outdoors, you know, um, you know, under the bright sun, as any artist would know. And so these modules, by shaping them or by, you know, by setting them up in different um, configurations, allowed us to create corridors, galleries, uh, sort of like uh, centerpieces, you know, um, it almost kind of like replicates the museum experience in a quite an outdoor setting. And that's largely because of this kind of like second idea in, in social architecture that's about freedom of movement. Um, a lot of our structures are built to segregate, you know, um, and we architects, we enjoy talking about uh, accessibility, right? We always talk about accessibility for the you know, disabled. Um, but actually, a lot of architecture discriminates so much against such a big slice of our population. It especially discriminates against the most vulnerable parts of our population. Um, to give you an idea, for you to enter like a museum or like a library here, you have to first, you know, go through a gate. You have to um, go through security. Of course, you go through the front door. You have to register, right, with the registration. Then you get information. Maybe get a guide. So it's like five or six steps too many just to get what you actually want to reach and. If you're someone who does not have the luxury of maybe time, you know, like someone who's busy who can't take the time to go out of his way to go through the process, or someone who does not have the luxury of a proper costume, like um, this guy here who's selling, you know, tofu. Um, you know, um, he's a street vendor. He's wearing slippers. He's not properly, you know, attired maybe for a more formal library. But, you know, when he gets tired in the middle of the day, he can drop by, he can borrow a book. Um, so, you know, it's about making everything accessible to the population that actually needs it the most. You know, the people who actually need our institutions the most are the ones who, you know, don't have access to much of our urban luxuries or amenities. And I feel like we need to change how we build our cities in as much as, for example, this is the Mehan Gardens. It was recently walled off by some misguided politician, most likely. I remember growing up, this was an open space, you know, where everyone could just walk in. And yet now we're starting to wall off our parks, our gardens, especially during this pandemic, we're limiting how many people can go in. Um, it just doesn't say much, you know, about our society, especially in the, here in the Philippines, where every establishment has security guards by the door that tries to ensure you have maybe the proper attire, you have proper shoes maybe, or whatever. And this is the largest armed force in the country, bigger than our armed forces, bigger than our police force. Uh, you know, all this security trying to separate us from everyone else. And we feel like this needs to change. And one of the projects we've been doing is this stadium um, that we were tasked with. Uh, one of the challenges of designing a stadium especially for a country like the Philippines where, you know, we're not a football crazy country, we're a basketball crazy country. Um, you know, a lot of these stadiums end up being white elephants, right? Uh, a lot of them, they get built, you know, to showcase, you know, something for the city maybe or the province, but they rarely get used or utilized. So we, when we were faced with this project, we really tried to figure out how we can do this better, how we can change this typology. So when we started to kind of like just build this study model for the development, we noticed that there's actually a park in front of it, which is Rizal Park. And then, you know, right across um, is the main uni state university for the province. And so we told ourselves, what if the park or the stadium you know, it's actually, you know, just a stadium project in disguise, but we're trying to actually build a stadium park. So if we chop off one end of the stadium and just make it completely open and barrier free, then what we actually are building is an extension to the park itself and not just a stadium. And by closing off the road that separates this from the university, 
then the stadium grounds kind of like becomes part of the quadrangle or the campus, you know, for the students to actually enjoy. And so then it becomes, you know, very integrated into the city, especially this stadium in particular, because this was right in the middle of the city. And so I think it was also kind of like learnings from, you know, this, um, this mall that we did in, um, this was in another province in Batangas. And instead of like doing, you know, a shopping mall as we normally do here, what we tried to do is we've tried to kind of like build um, these like individual structures I believe there are like about 26 different structures here. They're all porous, you know, they have alleyways, they have different size public areas from plazas to, a foot, to the largest football pitch in the province, you know, to picnic grounds, to gardens, to subterranean, you know, um, tunnels. Um, you know, we're trying to build in this diversity of urban spaces, you know, instead of like just building a, a shopping mall with a nice outdoor patio or whatever. And so that kind of like informed us that kind of like maybe open spaces, you know, needed to be developed more, especially in our primary structures. You know, of course, it's nice to think about, you know, romantic structures like what we did with the library and the museum. But how do we kind of like translate this idea when we start working with uh, facilities like this stadium? So this is what we did with the stadium. We chopped off one end of it and just said it's open to everyone. It's a part of the park. It's an extension of the park. And so now instead of building a stadium, which nobody really uses, we've ended up building this stadium park. And so that's what it's going to look like. Um, this is going to finish, hopefully, first quarter of next year. And I think by also connecting this with the adjoining university, you know, now it's just part of the campus. You know, it's no longer a separate destination, but, you know, it's available to everyone. And that's what we mean by saying that architecture should not be discriminatory. You know, it should be open to everyone. Um, and we've worked this idea into spaces like we've built um, a community mall where we just built a roof and said, you know, every, all this, there are no walls actually, it's open on all sides. And we've, you know, um, that's one of the things that we've been exploring with social architecture. Now, the third idea we explore with social architecture is this idea about social scale. Um, you know, we architects always talk about the human scale. Um, actually, that's what our first book was called anyway. Um, but I think, you know, for our city to work, for an immense city, an immensely dense city like Mega Manila to work, I think each piece of public architecture, especially, has to keep in mind that we're also, we should be building at a social scale, that everything we build for the public serves to connect everyone. Well, they should be connective elements, they should be connecting tissue that brings all of us together, or at least ties the community together. And so this was a project we really latched onto that, you know, we really wanted to embrace. Um, this was a project called the River Lane. The River Lane will be the first pedestrian bridge that crosses our Pasig River. If you imagine the Pasig River actually bisects the entirety of Manila. And Manila itself was founded along the mouth of the Pasig River. That's the whole impetus for why we are even living here. And we all call ourselves the Tagalog people or people of the river. And yet not a single pedestrian crossing is built across the river. I mean, so we simply neglect that and, you know, we just drive through the river. And we feel like by allowing you know, by building, you know, a pedestrian or more pedestrian crossings, because we definitely hope to build much more pedestrian bridges. Um, it allows us to kind of like, you know, um, relate more to our river instead of treating our river as a backyard, you know, where we throw all the effluents and all that. Um, I think we, we have to start embracing our waterfronts or our riverfronts. And so by building pedestrian bridges, you know, by allowing people to stay on the bridge, you know, this allows them to have, you know, more attachment, you know, and see the state of their river, the river that kind of like is the fountainhead for our city, right? And so what we've done here is we said, you know, maybe Filipinos have actually kind of forgotten what it means to walk across the river because we haven't really done that in, I don't know how many, since I was born, I would say. And so we said, what is a bridge anyway, right? Um, is it just a crossing point? But if you think about it, a bridge is actually a nexus of activities, right? It's a hub. If you look at um, medieval bridges, for example, you know, like the Ponte Vecchio in Florence or in the bridges of Isfahan in Iran, you know, um, a lot of these bridges actually has program on it, right? Because actually back then, you know, people meet 
meet on the bridge, right? I mean, when they cross, it's a crossing point, it's a hub of activity. And so we said, you know, maybe how we reintroduce, you know, pedestrian bridges to the public and encourage them to walk on them is by, you know, inserting program into our bridge, you know, by providing spaces for, you know, um, street performers, for vendors, uh, for events, or for live events and activities um, by making it, you know, a destination, you know, where they can watch over the sunset instead of just, you know, a piece of in infrastructure that they cross. And I think that means that largely ties into this idea about social architecture in that we should be building social infrastructure. You know, we should not just be looking at bridges and roads, you know, as pieces of engineering, but I think we have to get more involved as architects for us to be able to develop uh, more human, you know, um, urban settings. And so that's why we've, you know, been embracing this project. We've, you know, brought in Dow Chemical to provide, you know, um, the rubberized walk, you know, as, you know, um, as a grant for us. Uh, we've worked with the government to be able to get funding uh, for this bridge. And we actually are going to be operating the bridge initially once we turn this over and finish building it by the end of the year, hopefully, you know. Um, so this is what the bridge looks like. Um, and it sort of like answers the question of like, um, it's not just about building for whom, right? I mean, architects were always asking for whom do we build? But it's also interesting to ask who's building, you know, um, who, who are building, you know, these pieces of community space, um, these, these pieces of infrastructure, who is actually in charge of this? So that brought us to this kind of like idea about the pavilion that we did that we did last February for anthology. Um, we were looking at this idea about what is architecture? Um, is architecture the piece of paper or the notation? You know, as um, the host, the grandpa that always says that I forgot his name. Anyway, is architecture the piece of paper, the act of drawing, um, the structure itself? Um, so, you know, we kind of like wanted to, you know, um, rekindle this idea of the master builders of, you know, old, you know, maybe of, you know, ancient Egypt or classical Greece, where you actually have the builders or the master builders on site determining what to build on the spot. And that's what we actually did with this pavilion in that we said, we'll go through it with actually these two drawings and say, we'll build the entire without actually permits or engineering or anything. And we'll build this pavilion. And we said, you know, we can make use of what materials available so everything is recycled. And we'll show how it can be built fast and ideas can be executed and iterated on site, you know, um, if the architects are there, you know, dictating how things are built. And this was what we ended up building, you know, as a pavilion for anthology last year. Um, and for us, you know, it was a very interesting experience. Um, it allows, it showed us like, you know, you know, things do not always go according to plan because the site, of course, the trees and all that had its own quirkiness, the small slope on the site that we didn't know. But that brings us to kind of like the project we're talking about today. Um, so last March, I think, you know, everyone was kind of like, you know, at the height of this pandemic when we didn't know what COVID-19 was. It wasn't even called COVID then, right? It was the coronavirus. And the world really was kind of like in a state of emergency and everyone was panicking and toilet paper was running out, right? And in the Philippines, you know, um, of course, we were starting to fear also about this kind of like, you know, strange new pandemic. Um, and I think our hospital started to shut down. They were saying they were at capacity. They issued memos, refusing any more patients. And this was the world we were living in. Actually, the world we still live in up to this day, right? And, you know, of course, as you see the numbers, you know, you see the numbers climbing up, you start to feel a little bit of fear, you know, but also you start to kind of like question your sense of purpose about what is it? can you do, you know, you know, of course we started to, you know, donate food to the frontliners and all those things. Um, you know, um, our architect friends started to say, let's build, you know, these acrylic boxes for the hospitals, 3D print uh, face shields, uh, build this, this sanitation, uh, sanitation tents or whatever. And, you know, that started to get me thinking about like, well, um, as an architect, what else can we do? Um, I think we are we not the people most kind of like best positioned 
to be able to augment the capacity of our hospitals, right? I mean, who else can do it if not us? And the thing that we needed most at that point in time was more space for everyone, right? If the hospitals are full, the only solution you have is to build more space, okay? So we kind of like embraced you know, that idea. So I think around March 24th, you know, I was having this conversation with a doctor friend of mine from childhood. And we were talking about, okay, what can we do? And we said, and I just realized the day before, you know, somebody was calling me about donating these acrylic, printing out these acrylic face shields in our office and all those things. And I said, you know, maybe we should help the hospitals, right? That's what we need most. And we said, we can augment the capacity of the hospitals. And I remembered the pavilion we did for anthology and said, we can build something like this in five days and we can build it for every hospital, right? So we started to think about logistics and then, so we called up some of our friends from the military. Uh, at that point in time, the Philippines was in complete lockdown. Nothing was open. There are no hardware stores. Nothing was open. Um, so we needed the help of the military for us to be able to pick up, you know, all the materials to build, right? We had the military trucks. We needed the military passes. So, so we worked closely with the armed forces of the Philippines. And then the next day, we started to design. We started to form teams, you know, um, you need a team to design, you need a team to execute or to build, uh, you need a team to feed the construction workers, you need a team to do logistics, you need a team to do traffic, um, you need actually a team to do um, technical consultation because, you know, we open source all the plans to make it available to everyone. Um, there was a team for fundraising, there are actually like three teams for fundraising. Um, so we needed to raise the funds to build the facilities. And we began with the idea of building one, which quickly became, okay, let's build four facilities and they can serve as prototypes, you know, um, for the government to carry out their job. But we quickly got kind of like swamped and inundated by questions, you know, from the government or requests about building it for them, actually, because they didn't know how to do it. And so we had to quickly kind of like ramp up, you know, our group to be able to consider building, you know, 20, 40, 60 facilities. And I think we were able to do that with the help of everyone, you know, um, coming together. Um, we built our first facility uh, or finished our first facility five days after we started. We started on March 28th and finished the first one on April 1st. So this was kind of like the total ramp up of how we built the facilities, right? Um, we ended up building about 75 facilities, about uh, 1,200 beds. And, you know, actually we kind of like, in about from March 24th to about April 24th we were, or April you know, 30th, we built the majority of the facilities or about 60 of them already. And, you know, again, it really feels good to see what role architects can play in our community, right? How we can address a very basic need, which only architects can actually achieve, right? How we can actually address the need for shelter one of the most basic human needs. And, you know, if you look at, you know, this advisory from the WHO, um, well, up to now, really, the best way for you to deal with the pandemic is isolation, right? Um, this is easier said than done in a country like the Philippines. Like I said, we live in the densest, you know, city in the world. This is in Tondo, in Manila. At the height of the lockdown, at the height of quarantine, at the height of pandemic, while well, everyone's still out in the streets. And, you know, of course, we bemoan these situations and say, you know, if only people would be more disciplined if they would listen. But the unfortunate reality is that they have no space to call their own. You have six or eight people living in a small squalid room. You have, very, I don't know how many families sharing a single bathroom. There's just no way to isolate. The most isolated they can be is to stand by the street. And so, I think it has to be with this sense of an um, like all of community approach, you know, of how we can actually deal with this pandemic. But we have to recognize that it is the most vulnerable parts of our community who actually need our help the most. And one of the things in terms of like how government has addressed this pandemic, at least initially, you know, I think now they've learned, but at least initially it was kind of like what this facility is in China is doing 
it's centralized, you know, um, it's far off somewhere, maybe a hundred kilometers to the north um, or wherever, you know, it can be in the city, but, you know, not everyone is from that neighborhood. Um, it's unknown, you know, you don't even know, especially, you know, if you look at the masses or the, you know, um, the more vulnerable parts of our city, they don't even know where that place is. They have no idea what's going on. They're uneducated. There's much restriction to who can go or not. Of course, transportation is heavily restricted. And then it needs much, much more long-term planning, which does not immediately happen you know, in an emergency, right? So I think if I'm not mistaken, it took government like two, three months to finish the first facility here. Whereas if you build something that's local, right? You build something that's near, you build something that's familiar, you know, anyone, no matter what their situation is in life, where they live, when we get sick, we go see the doctor, right? And so if you build something that augments the capacity of your hospital, if you build something that is accessible immediately and it's local, then people become, you know, it's easier for them to deal with the idea of isolating or quarantining, right? Rather than sending them somewhere where they've never even been to. And the beauty about this is that it's immediate. Right, five days after beginning your build, you finish it, and so the next day, actually, we have some where the you know right after the same day that afternoon, you know, patients are moving in, because you know it's about adding you know this incremental spaces to each hospital. You're adding sixteen beds, twenty beds at most, I think thirty-two beds to each hospital facility, and so you're slowly building up your capacity as a you know as a as a city. So. You know, what makes up these facilities is very simple, really. Um, there's basically three main elements. You have the nurse stations where, you know, your healthcare frontliners are. You have the ward area where you have 16 different rooms, you know. Um, and then, of course, ventilation is one way um, to avoid cross-ventilation or cross-contamination. And then at the back area, you have the toilet facilities. So each of these basic modules houses about um, 16 patients. Right, um, the facade we're using the skin. Um, we're using plastic sheets, you know, um, and then of course they they alter between transparent and opaque, and then this allows them to have a view outside, especially since they're mostly placed in the um, parking area, in the covered courts, in the in the parks or in the plazas. You know, it allows you to see outside and be less fearful. And this idea that you can you are not actually trapped, but you can actually cut through plastic anytime you want and escape means that you still have your freedom. You're there of your own volition or your own choice. Um, the structure is very simple. You have a platform you know, where all your utilities pass through. You have this framework that's using timber. And you have your skin, which is metal roofing and plastic sidings. Um, and it's all very modular, um, how it's built. This is one module. And kind of like um, each facility is made up of around 10 or 12 modules, depending on the size of the facility. So the main considerations for us to build these facilities were speed and scalability. Right? Remember, we said done in five days. That should be a promise you keep because it's not a promise to anyone but yourself. So finish this in five days with 20 people. Um, that's it. Um, it has to be modular. So we can build three. You know, If it's needed, you can build four. You can build eight. Uh, we had someone build. I think 12 of them in one site. I don't know how many, oh, no, 20 of them in one site, actually. Um, we use plastic and wood or wood and plastic because of its availability. It's available everywhere. You know, in any island in our archipelago, I mean, I'm sure even in Malaysia, you'll see wood and plastic wherever. And these materials are very forgiving. If you make a mistake, you cut it, you throw it away, you cut a new piece, you put it in. It's not something that needs to be ordered, especially for this project. And then the, the other idea is this idea of scalability. You know, building one facility is useless. Building 10 is actually useless. You need to build so many of them, right? The idea is to be able to address all the needs of the different hospitals. So it has to be simple, meaning there's no complicated plans involved, right? You know, anyone can build it. Um, it needs to be something that, you know, you can build with our community. If you want to build something for, for example, in a province in Bulacan, the people in Bulacan need to be able to build it. If you need to build something in the rural area like we did here also, the people there should be able to build it. It has to be something that can, that can be built by hand. Remember in an emergency at the height of any quarantine or if you know another pandemic happens, hopefully not, 
um, there is a lack of equipment, right? You cannot bring in equipment, you cannot plan, you're not even supposed to be driving on the roads. So it needs to be something that can be built without any major piece of equipment, right? And it needs to be adaptable, meaning whatever the site situation is, whether it's big, small, it's L-shaped, it's triangular, it, whatever the shape of the site is, you should be able to fit it. For example, you can fit it inside a basketball court where you, this one, we ended up doing 60 beds here. So it should be adaptable. You know, and that's where the architects actually come in. Um, so, you know, these facilities, they have to address, you know, this urgent need, right? They have to fulfill this in five days. And, you know, this is how it looks like when you're building it. You build basically the whole day and you finish in, you actually finish in four and a half days, basically. Um, so how do we build one? Uh, we start by putting in the, these shipping pallets as a platform. This is where we run our pipes through. So, you know, your, your, your water, your electrical components, they pass through this. Then you put up the walls, the timber frames, right? Um, the timber frames, you know, actually you learn from the workers how to actually build them. You put them together, you know, once the timber frames are up, you start putting in the skin, you start putting in the roof. Basically in around three, three and a half days, you have your structure done. Then you start, you know, installing the flooring, you start putting in, you know, the, the utilities. And in five days, you have your facility. But the reason why we were able to keep on iterating and working on this is what we were working, you know, with all the workers actually, or the construction workers on site. I remember telling a group of workers, you know, in one of the bigger sites, I was telling them like, guys, for the first time in your lives, you're actually building something not for someone rich. You're actually building something for yourself because this is for your own community. And so I think it's a big deal that you're actually learning from them also how to work best with the materials that they're most familiar with. So for example, the framing systems that we did or the bracing systems were changing or constantly iterating. We're also constantly talking to the, you know, to the doctor who's in charge of the facility, the medical workers. We ask them what they need, what they want actually. And so a lot of the facilities, they actually evolve, you know, like how it's being used, you know, how, how the community actually ends up using them. And you do not dictate how they're being used. What you're doing is you're providing space. You're giving the hospitals more space. And of course, they can know better how to make use of them. And so we feel like that's sort of an answer to the question of like, what role do architects play in our communities, right? Who are we architects, right? We also are frontliners. Um, for example, we're here with, you know, doctors, professors, um, soldiers, engineers. Um, you know, we need the architects in our front lines. Um, that's Jeffrey from Taylor's, um, we need to be there because, you know, somebody needs to build shelter. That's our most basic need. And I think it shows the importance of what architecture means versus an engineering, you know, identity is that this is the technical group for the facilities is that architects are able to bring so many different people and resources together, right? We are sort of like, we are master builders we connect everyone, we bring things together. And that's really the role we play at the hub or center of construction or building activity, right? We are able to, you know, um, change things by being on site. We're able to apply things differently. We're able to solve problems with immediacy, especially if we are, you know, really working something from, you know, our heart. And so I think, you know, that the people see this and, really they embrace it you know even the workers you know the doctors of course um you know everyone comes together in terms of like trying to serve the community and you bring in the different vendors i think we're the, one of the few people who can actually ask a vendor to give us materials right so they we, you know we can generate so many resources so much funding from our clients as well but i think the most important thing about what an architect's role in a community is, or maybe the answer in terms of like how we're different from engineers is that engineers might be able to build the best structure. They might be able to build most efficiently or more efficiently than us, but we are definitely better able to project or plan what a community actually needs, right? We are planners, we are ideators, we imagine things. And when faced with emergencies, right? we kind of like are more able to figure out how to move forward 
and by being more in touch with you know our communities or society we're more able to kind of like see what is needed right and this is kind of like the graph overlaid um, from the construction of the facilities with how you know daily cases were going you know um, in our country um, this particular graph is from March 24th when we started to June 30th um, this crazy line here you know coming down is the percentage of um, the case fatality rate right and how it went down and then you know this line here total confirmed cases um, daily new cases. Um, the idea really is like, if you can see, it all kind of like overlaps to when you kind of like stop building. I mean, I'm sure it's not the main reason, but I believe that space, you know, is one of the prerequisites that we will need to be able to deal with this. I mean, the reality is we'll probably be living with the pandemic for the, you know, short or short term or foreseeable future, right? And, you know, maybe how we deal with this is it becomes much, much more manageable if we can ensure that there's a space for everyone. You know, that when you go to a hospital, you're not going to be turned down, that it's not going to be full. I think that's the best solution we can find for this pandemic right now. And so, you know, um, I think it really, you know, for us, it's really about finding space for everyone, right? Architecture needs to confirm to confirm what our role is. We need to say, you know, what is it? that an architect should be doing, right? What, what is the past positive impact that we can do for our community? Who are we? What roles do we serve? And, you know, given if we were living in a utopian society or in a Trek world, what do we do, right? We do, we build, right? You know, we might like to design, we might like to draw, we might see architecture is about the process, but at the very, basic level, you know, architecture is about building, it's about providing space, you know, it's about be being that master builder who thinks for the community, who imagines what's needed and finds out how to do that, right, figures it out. And so for us ourselves, we were able to build, you know, all these 75 different facilities, you know, like I said, throughout Mega Manila, as far north as 80 kilometers, as far south as 100 kilometers, we were able to build about 1,200 rooms ourselves. And by outsourcing all our plans, we made our plans available online. We outsource, we, out, not out, we open source, but we open source all the plans. We made them available online. So people on other islands from Cebu, you know, um, in Kamsur, I think this was the site where they built 20 facilities, you know, in Davao, in Palawan, in Sulu, um, for those Filipinos here, it's like the war-torn area of the Philippines. Um, you know, they were able to build facilities for their own communities. Right. And you can see how they iterate. They make use of what's available. You know, they have like glass doors, they have tarpaulins. You know, um, so in the end, over 3,500 beds were built. Um, we ourselves built about 2,500, uh, 1,200. Um, some corporate sponsors, they built their own facilities. Uh, you know, volunteers from other islands, like I said, in Cebu, in Naga, throughout our country, archipelago built another thousand facilities. The LGUs finally started to, you know, get the plans. I think I remember for Manila, we built two facilities and they built 20 more. Um, so, yeah. And I think we were able to reach out to our friends in Singapore and they built 3,000 3, beds themselves. Um, and so we were able to show how quickly, you know, how nimble architecture can be, what emergency architecture is, and, you know, how we as architects can fulfill a very basic, role in our society. And so with that EQF story, I think I leave you guys maybe and show you this kind of like short video. Hi everyone, I'm William T. Jr. I'm the arch principal architect of WTA Architecture and Design Studio. Um, so right now during the lockdown, uh, we're building these emergency quarantine facilities for our cities. We're building 65 of these facilities uh, to fill about a thousand beds and we feel like this is our role as architects and builders to provide shelter for our community, to provide space for all the patients who might need them. So this whole facility, um, it's made of wood and plastic. It's easy to build, it's lightweight. You can finish one of these in five days. And so the idea is that no man should be left without a space and everyone can find and be assured of having somewhere to stay if they're sick. 
So hope everyone's keeping safe. Take care and stay home. Thank you. And with the EQF, I think we were able to generate about $1.5 million um, to build you know, these facilities, which makes them very cheap and very affordable, actually. Um, and you know, I think I leave you guys with kind of like this message you know, um, about the structures we built. Um, it's, a, it's about the process of architecture. right? Um, it's about how we came together to build for our communities. Um, it's a proof you know, that shows that we are relevant, that communities do need us. And it highlights how architecture, you know, at the most basic level, you know, um, when push comes to show, um, you know, when there's a pandemic going on, when everyone's afraid, um, you know, the real, the real communal function of architecture is to build for our communities. And so that's it for me today. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, William, for a very inspiring and a very relevant uh, talk for today. It's directly relevant to what we're doing in semester six now because uh, the project is focused on people, place, and time. And likewise, it's a form of social architecture. And I think you made mention in the beginning that you're, I think it's a good example of third space or third place, yeah. which we're also doing. And I think most importantly, the, the goal for some six uh, for this semester is create, creating positive space, a positive place for people. And we do, I think our site, the Chow Kit and Manila has a sort of similarity in a way. So hopefully the students have learned a lot uh, to look into the people, the place and its value. And not only just the negative aspect of it, but likewise the positive side of it. Okay, so probably with that, we open the, the, the time now for questions. Uh, I'm sure our, my colleague would like to start. Oh, there's a, someone raising her, her hand. I oh, know. <laughs> I thought it was okay from the student. Any, any question from my colleagues and uh, the students? Or probably Manny, would you like to throw the first question to William? <laughs> if you have. Uh, Manny, are you around? <laughs> yeah. Sorry to put you in the spotlight. No, no, it's okay. It's, I, I'm okay. around. Uh, I don't know. I probably would just like to find out. So the the modules of those uh, structures you did is what is it a standard that it can be built almost everywhere? Yeah. Um. So the basic module is about six by two meters. Um, so then it's how many modules you build, you know, how to get how many beds. Um, then we have, you, know, you can make an L shape out of it. You can make a T shape. Um, there's a V one actually somewhere. I don't know why, but yeah. So one module will have how many beds? Um, the typical, so one module, the, the two by six is two beds, but I mean like one typical one is about 16 beds. So if you, the standard is 16 beds. I mean, if they don't, if it doesn't need to be custom, customized for the site, it's about 16 beds. And how many has been built so far? Um, well, we kind of stopped counting, but we, we built, personally, we built about um, 75 of them. That's, that's, that's a way of giving back to the community, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That's all, Prince. Okay, thanks, Manny. And I think we live, you shared the design to, uh, you shared your design for free, right? To yeah, we opened people, yeah. the files, yeah. And we said, you know, everyone use for this however you may see fit. Okay. So thanks. I think we have one question from our student, uh, Jesse. Hi, architect William. I really like the idea of blurring the boundaries for the public to access knowledge and arts. Uh, her question is, would it be the thing about the community architecture is that people are always concerned about it is if it's safe enough to leave resources open to public uh, how how do you maintain it how about the maintenance i think that was that is her question actually when we started the experiment with the book stop right we said i wonder how long these books are gonna last mm -hmm. and he said okay let's just contain order like container loads of books and we started to talk to like random house with the bank penguin different publishers and said can you donate books to us because like we were afraid that the books will all disappear right 
Well, even until today, almost every day or so, you get requests for donations. Like everyone keeps giving books because, like, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, especially if you're living in a in an Asian city where you have limited space, right? You have more books than you need usually if you're a book lover. And for some reason, or like I guess for a good reason, you don't want to throw away books. So you always are looking for somewhere to put your old books, right? And I think it's a good way to kind of like, you know, um, extend the life, you know, the lifespan of a book. Um, so far, um, from our experience, I think it's there's been we ended we have more, way more books than what we started with actually we actually stopped accepting donations already because like there's <laughs> nowhere to put them right um but also i think it's this idea that something that's open you know there's this like communal security right because like if you know the more eyeballs are on something you know the less you want you don't steal in public basically so i think that helps a lot you know this idea of you know, communal securities. That's why if you look at the bookstop, you can actually see it from every side. You can see inside. Um, and also not just for the books, but actually that's for safety so that there's nothing, you know, fishy happening inside because again, there's no librarian, you know, there's no nothing. The house rules are followed by, you know, to each his own. And so, yeah, I think it's about communal security. And I think as a society develops, you know, I was talking about the street children in particular, right? At first they were like, you know, I, I want to bring home the books. And you see it, you know, they bring home three books instead of just one, you know, they bring it. And they end up, and then after a week or two, I said, oh, so why are you not bringing home the books anymore? They're like, ah, it's taking up so much space at home. My parents are getting angry. And just They just realize what a public library is and they just start reading there, right? And then they even start to teach us how to arrange the books. I remember it's like this really smart girl. Because like when, like I said, you have more books than you have space, right? So if you see in even bookstores where shelf space is paramount, they arrange books like this. So one on top of the other where you cannot see the back title, right? So she said, why don't you arrange books like this so you can read them both, both titles? And I said like, hey, that's kind of a good idea. And so we started arranging all the books that way. It was a street, street kid who actually taught me how to do that. It's fun. And they started becoming little librarians. They started, you know, telling the other kids how to behave. And so that's really, you know, how it happened there. But at the end of the day, I think, of course, you build it, you know, like for us, the structure was made of steel. So it's easier to, you know, it's more durable. Um, maintenance, of course, will always be an issue. But as with any public space, I think an indoor space would be much harder to maintain, actually, because, of course, it's much more sensitive, right? Whereas if you're building something that's more robust, that's more intended for to be abused, actually, then, you know, it's actually not so hard to maintain. Thanks, William. I right, hopefully uh, that answers Jesse's question. <laughs> okay, any question from the from the students and from my colleagues? Uh, Ed, do you want to ask anything? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Thanks, please. Uh, hello, William. Yeah. What you are doing uh, really inspiring, especially if, if I'm one of the students. Uh, I will really get inspired a lot by. Or the socially driven or community driven work. So I, I do have a question that I want to ask you. What are the challenges or, or some of the burdening issues that you have come across when doing socially responsible architecture? Uh, for example, you know, like when it is very community or communal driven, uh, we have a lot of stakeholders. Unlike like commercial practice, uh, we do have only one client or even one project manager. Uh, they do. Uh, make that decision, uh, but when it comes to community, so there are a lot of stakeholders. So, who makes the call? Is it architects or there are a lot of decision makers? And then, how do you deal with them? How do you draw the line? Saying, okay, we need to do that. We we, we can't we, we can't negotiate. Uh, we, we need to draw a line. We need to move on. But you know, uh, so how do you deal with, with all those uh, issues come along? Um, yeah, I think, you know, in, for strange in the Philippines, there's a different kind of problem about these things, right? Um, it's not so much a problem of who makes the decision because honestly, the, the politicians are not very involved anyway. So they're like, you build whatever you want, which is actually easier than commercial projects for us right now, at least. No. The biggest problem that we find is that getting approval is hard, not because they're strict, mind you, okay? It's hard to get approval because there's always, 
there's endemic corruption, right? And so for a project that's social, for a social project that wherein there's no money involved, so nobody makes money. If nobody makes money, nobody wants to work. And so that's a big challenge for a country like ours, for a developing country, right? For, you know, a project might benefit everyone, but if no one stands to make anything, any, you know, profit out of it, so, you know, of course, there's no corruption involved because there's no money involved. And so that kind of makes, you know, the approval process much, much slower because nobody wants to put in the work or the paperwork at least, you know. So I think how we deal with that is you really have as an architect really, or I wouldn't even say as an architect, but as an advocate, you know, you really approach it as an advocate and you actually do more than just the architecture. You really push for the program. It's about a totality. You know, the, the, the architecture is a very small part of it. I think the program is much bigger and much more relevant because like you said, you build it and how do you maintain it? So it's really about how do you, so design is a small part, getting it approved and built is a bigger part, but you know, the complete life, life cycle, you know, what it is after it gets built is much, much bigger. And so I think, you know, in a way we have to start looking at architecture as not just the design or building of a structure, but you know, a more complete life cycle for a building, not because of sustainability, but because of like how it will serve our communities. So I think that's the challenge now um, that we're seeing. And so how you also deal with that is, you know, not just by advocating, but also by, you know, um, working with everyone else. Um, of course, the more voices that speak, you know, the stronger, the more contacts you have, the more people you know. Um, so we started working with, for example, libraries, we started working with librarians, you know, um, we start working with the people who are actually directly involved. And that makes it a bit easier because now if, you know, maybe there's no money involved, but then if a politician hears, you know, push coming from different sectors, then it becomes more, you know, interesting for them to work on, you know. Um, so that's how we've been doing. Uh, we've been trying, we try to garner support from other um, sectors to help us push for a project. And we make sure that, you know, of course, our architects will always say, okay, it's very site specific. But then we try to say, you know, this idea can work here, there, here, there. So, you know, that there's multiple options, right? If this one doesn't fly, then you have the other two or three alternate options going on. For example, the bridge, that was not the first site. That was the second site, actually, that got approved. The first site, it's a bridge, right? So there's two different cities on each side. One side wouldn't approve it, so we couldn't go. Um, so, yeah, that's how we kind of, like, started dealing with these things. Selamat. Selamat. Okay. Is this is that Filipino? <laughs> okay. Is say do you have any question uh, for William? Hi William. Well, well yeah. Uh, that is such an inspiring uh, sharing session. Um, making. I don't know about the rest, at least it's making me feel really bad for not <laughs> being able to contribute um, for my professional life, which I have left behind <laughs> now. I wish I could do more. Um, that's very inspiring, and I hope I can um, inspire my students to do more of what you are doing, the young oh, people. You. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh... Manin, do you have anything for any question? Uh, what happens to the, what happens to the building after? Which is building? It, sorry. All your all your um, EQ what do you call it? EQP EQ. Ah, uh, sorry. The the facilities EQ. they were meant well they were meant to be there for three months. That was initially yeah. the plan, but some of them are still there until now. So I guess. You know, it was supposed to just be a three-month pandemic, I would say. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I think more than half of them are still being used up to now. Um, some of them are being used for vaccination sites. One is actually a, surg a surgical room, a surgery room. Uh, if you believe it, I don't know why, but it's a surgery room. Um, a lot of them are being used as housing for the nurses and the medical workers. Um, so that they don't have to um, go home. Because, you know, of course, they're always in danger of, yeah. So, so, it's yeah. been um, so it's been upcycled and it's been reused for something else now? 
Yeah, but the idea really was for it to be um a three month. Yeah. Yeah. I think the materials held up. How does the materials hold up in terms um, of so the far, We've had typhoons and you know um <laughs> a few, some of them they don't get damaged from typhoons, they get damaged from falling trees. I mean, if ever so some of them have gone that you know been damaged by those things, yeah. Okay, good. Amazing stuff. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Thanks. Well, 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 yeah, thanks. Well, well, waiting for the students to formulate their questions. Okay, probably <laughs> you can ask <laughs> Jess. Jess, do you have anything for any question for William? Hi, hi William. Salamat. Um, hi, Jess. Um, it is um, very inspiring um, to see and uh, to know architect um, uh, doing some Samaritan jobs eh? uh, and work with the committee. Um, building for the local, uh, just looking at the last um, um, shelter uh, that you uh, did uh, with uh, a lot of other disciplines. Uh, um, uh, building for the local in a familiar uh, place, you know. So I'm, I'm just wondering uh, whether um, do you have any response like from the people who have used that place or who have recovered, you know, uh, in a place that is very familiar, whether there is a, a, um, um, a psychological or emotional benefits that make them recover from having a place that is within their community. They know their families are not far, their relatives are not far. I mean, is there any uh, positive notes on that one, uh, do you see? Yeah, um, well, I think, you know, no one's happy about being sick, for one. Um, but just to give you an example, uh, um, like a lot of the big facilities we built in the Philippines went unused. Actually, some of them were never even used, right? Um, all of our facilities were used. I mean, most of them, the, you know, immediately the next day after they were built. Because I mean, we didn't build if there was no demand. And so it was all quickly filled. I mean, like a few of them in Quezon, in one of the cities was like, we were basically kicked out when we didn't even have time to take a photo or something. Cause like, they just wanted to use it because that was the height of the pandemic. And everyone was kind of like panicking in fairness to the government. Everyone was panicking at that time. You know? um, so far, I mean, we have, we do have some photos, but we don't tend to show them. I mean, cause you know, privacy issues. Um, we, but we had to have photos because some of the grants that we got, you know, we needed to do surveys and all that. Um, yeah, we got them. Um, I think it's not, of course, what you wish for, you know, when you get sick. I mean, over, obviously, everyone wants a nice bedroom and, uh, you know, all those things, right? But it's definitely better than what the government was providing, actually, at that point in time. You know? um, actually, it's still better than what they're providing right now for some reason. I don't know why, but. Like now, I don't think they even have barriers between the beds anymore. They just put them in like a room and then everyone's just there. Um, so yeah, there's no of uh, there's no view out viewing outside. You're kind of like, you know, inside this like box or like a container van. Right? I think they're using a lot of shipping containers now. Um, of course, it's not insulated as well and all those things. Um, it's much better than what was provided, I would say. Um, yeah, so that's the feedback we got. But the problem is like, like up to now, a year and a half after, we're still get, especially of course now the pandemic, there's this wave, right? Um, we're get still getting requests to build them, and we haven't built one in a year, so I don't know. But they still keep requesting for us, and I wish they would figure it out on their own. I would say, um, I, I don't know, just but so what we do now is we recommend, we kind of like recommend contractors to them and say these are contractors that can build this. Um, the plans are obviously online, they're open source anyway, so just figure it out. But yeah, the sad part is like they're still they still keep asking us to build more. <laughs> well, let me have a question from our student uh, from Jesse. Yeah. yeah, as a student, is there any opportunity that uh, out there that allows us to contribute back to the community? I think some of us, our classmates, are also interested in in it okay, while we are doing our studio? Well, I would think so. I think there are so many opportunities. Um, for example, these things we've built are not 
you don't have to be an architect to actually build them, right? I would say we all know that um, it's about the willpower to get things done. And sometimes, you know, the passion and the ignorance of youth is actually a great advantage because you just doggedly keep on going regardless. Um, it doesn't cost much. You know, the good thing about these spaces, we're very conscious about building something that won't cost much because, you know, like I said, we're trying to address the needs you know, the more vulnerable communities really, um, right? You're not putting it in a posh subdivision. Nobody needs it there. Um, so you're trying to build something that is cost effective, that makes sense. And so it doesn't take much. It's a small grant. You know, you can always get a small grant, especially for students. I think you can apply for a grant. Um, I believe there are ways for you to come up. I'm not sure if there are barangays in Malaysia or kampungs or something, right? I'm not sure there is, there is. what the political unit is, but I'm sure there is. there are ways to help out your local barangays. We were just talking the other day. One of the things we're trying to figure out is the reason why nobody fixes our sidewalks is because nobody stands to make money from them. Mm -hmm. Right? It's so cheap. Who, who, who wants to push for sidewalks? I mean, it's you know nobody's mm. job, right? But you know, as students, you know, the sidewalks are the you know strongest part of our mobility system, especially for personal mobility, right? It's something that everyone has access to, and yet nobody seems to be figuring out. So I think it's about finding these small things really that are important to everyone. It's not, it's not that expensive also to buy that uh, mobile library, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. The library costs about um, like $8,000 maybe? $8,000. $8,000. We have about, including the lectures, will be chipping in like probably $1,000 each. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. 1000 ringgit. Okay. There we, can, we can build one. And donate it to our, our site child kit. <laughs> you know, the first one that actually got me to think about that library was actually in a university in Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, there was this like shelf just outside, you know, it almost is like was almost like a like a cart, you know, and then there was a shelf and then it was just open. And then you know, you can just get a book, give a book, you know, same idea, a uh, little free library. But I said, because like, you know, most of the little free libraries we see are just kind of like a small shelf on a wall, right? And I said, like, mm. well, you can actually make a space out of it because that one had seats on it. And so I said, like, you know, that can actually work. So that was one of the things that got us thinking about the library. Okay. $8,000. So okay. probably we can, we, can, we can start with that initiative of building one. Yeah, the okay. indoor ones are much cheaper. The indoor ones, yeah. I think, built for like, I think, $4,000. $4,000. Okay. Is it doable, guys? <laughs> we we give something back to the community yeah, after a semester six. Okay. Of course, the lecturers will give a greater amount of their share, bigger share, right? Ah, okay, Jesse was asking because in, in our group we formed this uh, Christmas initiative. Uh, we were inspired by the people of Child Kids. So I started with the I think I started with a 300 ringgit fund mm. in the, the, for Christmas we will be going going to the site uh, we are in site two and probably give some books uh, coloring books and groceries to people in child kit so as part of the uh, I think that that will happen uh, let's hope that the, <laughs> the pandemic is okay and will allow us to go to the site yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, but hopefully the whole the whole gang, the whole the whole class can also join us okay, with this initiative. Okay. Uh, I think we have one or two more questions for architect William. Uh, William, you also collect a lot of things. I can see a lot of yeah. uh, Mar Marvel character, DC characters at the back. <laughs> uh, I think some some the Hulk, yeah, <laughs> you can see it from like you spend a lot on on your collection, right? <laughs> um, you know, it's always one to have toys. I think architecture is about paying anyway. Correct. <laughs> I'm sure some of the students share, share the same passion as you are. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, we're all fan of the DC and the, the Avengers, and Marvel. Yeah. Okay, any 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 question from the guys? I think we run out of 
questions? Jesse, do you have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what, what sorts of uh, book can you recommend on social architecture, William? I, I know you're a very wide reader. You read a lot also. Yeah, I think most of the things that I find more relevant are books about, um, mostly about history, actually. History. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, I uh, forgot this. Like, mostly about history, I think. Those are, sometimes I feel like reading about architecture to do architecture it's almost like a you know like a Ouroboros, like a mm -hmm. self-eating yeah. cycle. So sometimes I feel like at least at my age, you start to read out, you should look for ideas outside of architecture now. Mm -hmm. So I really don't read architecture to do architecture in a lot of ways, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question from Melissa. Uh Hello, architect William. Thank you so much for inspire, for that inspiring presentation. I think your initiative to give back to the community is beyond amazing and a very humble approach to being an architect. I wanted to ask for the bridge uh, you're inspiring to build in Manila. How exactly would you say the bridge is more than just a bridge? I think how exactly would you say the bridge is more than a bridge? Can you please elaborate on how we can make a bridge more than just circulation space or transition space? Um, well, like I said, I think we were kind of like in sort of inspired also by the Rialto, by the Ponte Vecchio, you know, where you have shops on the bridge, right? In Venice, in Florence. And, you know, if you look at it, like I said, a bridge is not just a crossing point. It also is a meeting point, right? It's a place where two sides meet, right? Two different communities meet. And it's a place of exchange, you know, if you think about it, it's a place of exchange for ideas from both sides, you know. Um, so if you're connecting two communities instead of like people just, you know, going around, there's small communities every day. Now they can share with the other side of the bridge, right? And so I think we were looking at it that way. And what we did was we were basically building a platform for a park space. Um, you know, it's a bridge with benches, with, um, of course, vertical greens, um, it's a bridge with um, information um, about the surrounding communities where you can actually go through from there. Um, it's a bridge with um, areas for activities for like um, bustlers, for vendors. So you know, there's, you know, I remember walking down Brooklyn Bridge and you know, when you walk down, there's like this area where you have so many vendors and so much fun. I said, like, why can't we have it on the bridge actually? Um, but I think more importantly, it becomes interesting because we want people to actually stay on the bridge. Um, as the people here who've been to Manila are know, Manila, we're proud of our beautiful sunsets, right? Um, and I don't think any of us has actually kind of like tried to enjoy, you know, sunset on the river or what it or what how the river looks like, just because there's no space in Manila where you can actually sit down and look at the river. And so now we actually have this, you know, perfect space to see our city, enjoy the river. And the hope is that, you know, by having people stay here, that they can care more for the river, you know, um, because they can relate more to it. They know what it's about. They will see its problems because the problems, you know, for a river, you know, it's everyone's problem really. And for us, the first step towards any solution is always awareness. I think awareness is something we always forget when we try to push for any advocacy or agenda. And so it's actually a platform for awareness. I mean, that's what they're doing with the High Line also. So it's nothing new, right? I mean, the High Line is actually a platform for awareness as well. Um, it's maybe similar to Henderson Waves in Singapore where you can look out into the water, right? Um, so it's a bit of that, a bit of here. Um, but I think to make it more Filipino, more Manila, we want the bus... Uh, the buskers and the vendors on the bridge because you know that makes it very street and so I think we want a bit more of the street culture in it really similar to KL <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite yeah. very similar to Kuala Lumpur I, think, I, mean, I would say so I mean we're all yeah. Southeast Asians right Southeast Asian <laughs> or Malay anyway so yeah we have one more question from Ryan uh, Oh, Melissa, uh, sounds super exciting. Thank you for the elaboration. Uh, one, I think, final question from Ryan Ong. 
uh, high architect villa, may I ask whether there was any case of littering or damage happening on the public architecture civil? Um, for which one? Um, the bookstop project, not really. Um, for the Museo del Prado, there was. I think somebody drew on the boards or something <laughs> like that. I think there was one. Yeah, but you know, it's just a print anyway, so we just exchange it. No, uh, sorry, we didn't. We just took it out actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for the EQF, there was a guy who went a bit amok, like you know, a bit. Um, I think a bit crazy or something, and just kind of like slashed the walls and ran out. And you know, like, and I remember it was kind of bloody because, like, you know, he was like, I don't know, doing something with his arm. And then, yeah, so there was one, I think, instance with the EQF, if I remember correctly. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. The book stop. No, I think book lovers are kind of like a special breed of people, you know, like, you tend to be more civilized, maybe. <laughs> But yeah, that's actually going to be the biggest challenge with the bridge. That's why we said we were going to take over management of the bridge. Because I believe that's going to be the biggest challenge there where you might have people actually or homeless people sleeping on the bridge or anything like that. And so we said what we'll do is we'll actually employ some of the local, I don't know how you call them, stambais, you know, local uh, moms. <laughs> I don't know how do you call them, but like, employ them to actually be you know we said okay we don't want to say you're guarding the bridge but you're educating people about the bridge that's the part of that's what actually we're planning to do okay hopefully that answers ryan's question uh, okay i think we don't have any question and it's about 4 p.m uh, yeah again thank you so much architect william for your time yeah uh, I know you have a very busy place schedule. Thank you for joining us. I think on behalf of Taylor's University, you are part of Taylor's University now <laughs> thank <laughs> as thank our you. adjunct lecture, uh, associate professor. Okay. Okay, welcome. So I think, yeah, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Nice, nice to see all, you know, that's nice to see all of you. Hopefully we can all meet when the <laughs> pandemic ends. <laughs> Oh, hopefully we can join the anthology fest yeah, festival. Yeah. I'll take <laughs> October <laughs> or November next year. Actually, we're hoping because February. I'm sure we're still kind of like stuck up, so we're hoping okay. October or February. Maybe the pandemic might you know ebb by then. Will, will it have, have the same format for the live uh, competition? Yes. Uh, yes, the live okay. the live competition will definitely have that again. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's I, why we are moving it a bit further back so we can have a physical, you know. Uh, physical. Okay. Yeah. I think everyone misses physical events. Yeah. We were we were in Intramuros. I brought like four uh, students, if you remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Again, thank you for the warm hospitality. Yeah, We stayed in the, a five-star hotel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, hopefully, I'll take some, some, some of the students from this batch Yes. The anthology festival, or probably one of the other lecturers can uh, join also. Okay, hope so, so hope so. It's exciting uh, to travel, travel again yeah. Yeah. after two years, <laughs> one and a half years. Okay, probably yeah. before we end, uh, we forgot last time. Uh, we have to take a group photo, so I would like to request uh, Jesse will do the honors. Uh, uh, I would like to request everyone to switch on their camera as quickly as possible. But make sure that you are dressed, okay, before you switch on our camera. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Prince, let's choose Intramuros as our next site next sem. Well, okay. Okay. And Mr. Manny will finance all our plane tickets. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no problem. Okay. <laughs> Very great to answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you call me idiot. That's why. <laughs> okay, I have to edit that out. Okay. <laughs> That's the okay. recording. Okay. As a matter, it was addressed to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, uh, probably switch on. Take a break first. I know you're working on your your projects. Okay.
Come guys, let's turn on your camera. Oh, nice to see everyone. I can see a lot of mistakes uh, back <laughs> <from the image. laughs> My students are very naughty. <laughs> okay. Yeah, inspired by the lecturer. Ah, <laughs> there is. Because of the tutor, right? Yeah. <laughs> Any more people still turning on the yeah, camera? I'll take the screenshot in. Another five seconds. Okay, I'll take the first page first since you guys don't know which page you are. So just hold on with your pose. Okay, one, two, three. First page done. Second page, one, two, three. Okay, third page. One, two, three. Fourth page. One, two, three. Um, fifth page. One, two, three. Okay, that's it. Oh, thanks so much, Jesse, and thanks everyone for switching Thank you, on the camera. Okay, once again, thanks, William. Yeah. Thank you, William. Thank okay, you, we'll, Architect uh, William. Ar Architect William will have another lecture, so probably can join uh, for Urban Design Studio on the 30th of September. Okay, yeah. thanks everyone. Okay. Thanks, yeah. William. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Guys. See you. See you. Stay safe. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.